back and do the same all your lovely weather again. I'm just disappointed that we were not able to bring the good Florida weather back with us. <laughs> we tried, but uh, you and I couldn't bring it. So it's on its way, just walking along the foot of the Amtrak Trail. We got here before you did. The scripture lesson this morning is from Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 to 10. Hear the word of the Lord. After the Sabbath had dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and joined in the tomb, rolled back the stone, and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. <coughs> then go quickly and tell his disciples, He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. <clears throat> there they will see me. The word of God to the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Don, for reading that. God bless us for the reading of this word. Amen? Amen. So, one day, Moses, Jesus, and an old man went out to play golf. Now they were at the 19th hole, final hole. Whoever won this hole wins the game. So Moses comes up and he's aiming at the 19th hole, right? And there's a big pond in front of him. So Moses hits the ball and sure enough, lands in the pond. Moses walks up to the pond and he parts the waters. Hits the ball and it lands on the green. So then it was Jesus' turn. Jesus comes up and he hits the ball and sure enough it falls in this big gigantic pond that's right in front of the 19th hole. So Jesus comes to the ball and Jesus walks on the water, hits the ball and goes on the green. Finally the old man comes up. The old man hits the ball and again lands right in the middle of the pond. As it lands in the pond a fish swallows it up. As the fish swallows it up, a big giant tadpole swallows that fish. As the tadpole jumps out of the water, an eagle flies by, swoops down, and grabs the tadpole and flies off with it. As he flies off with the tadpole, the tadpole spits out the fish, the fish spits out the ball, the ball rolls on the green and right into the hole. A hole in one. <laughs> Moses turns to Jesus and says, I hate playing golf with your dad. <laughs> Never challenge God, right? Never challenge God. So here we are, Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday. And um, this is a story that many of us heard. Whether we believe it or not, we've heard of it. There's very few in the world that have not heard about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's what makes the difference between our belief and those of many other beliefs in the world, right? We always have people have that question, well, what's the difference between Christianity and all the other religions? Guess what? Our Savior rose from the dead and lives. Where, wh whatever the founder of the other religions are, he can still go to their grave. And guess what? They're there. Now, if it were possible, you could find the grave of Jesus, You'll find it. Amen. So this is a story that has echoed through.
through, through all time. And what do I mean by that? I mean, even Hollywood caught on to this, right? The idea that all is lost, all is drastic, you know, the, the hero is gone, but then there's a light of hope. Then there's a uh, something that breaks loose and changes the course of the story. Something saves the day. You see, that's the essence of the resurrection. And that essence of the resurrection runs through all the stories of human beings. All that we know, Hollywood and books and stories told around the campfire. Because there's, there's a, a thing within the hearts of men where we desire to know that there is life. That's the reason why these stories resonate with people. And that's the story why the resurrection still, today, affects and changes people's lives. Now, Jesus' resurrection is the turning point. Um, we were talking about this before Bob and I. Today's Daily Bread makes a statement that... Um, because of the resurrection. Huh? Nothing else matters. Nothing else matters, right? Because of the resurrection, <laughs> nothing else matters. But even if there wasn't a resurrection, then nothing else would matter. Right? I mean, what an awesome statement. The resurrection is the turning point in history. The turning point in the story of men. There's no greater significance that we could point to than this wonderful story of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, today I want to talk to you about the three gifts of the resurrection. These are three gifts of the resurrection that are fulfilled in us, the believer. So let's, I, I know that there are many other things that the resurrection brings to our lives. There are many other things. But today I want to focus on these three. So I'm going to get right into it. The first one is this. Life beyond the grave. The resurrection, the gift of the resurrection, number one, is life beyond the grave. Jesus' resurrection guarantees us life beyond the grave. That's the first gift. It finds hope in the midst of despair. The resurrection tells the Christian that sin, that our sin, that our dark past does not define our future. I don't know if you caught that. Our past does not define our future. That's the gift of the resurrection. Many of us live in the past. Many of us live either holding on to bitterness towards others, or to ourselves because of our past. But when we surrender to this power, this gift of the resurrection, as believers in Christ, our past does not have to define our future. I hope that sinks in your heart today, that you understand that. The resurrection is about new beginnings. Starting over. New life. It's about life beyond the grave. It's about having this confidence that what Jesus promises, he will do. We read that today. He rose from the dead. And then he says, just as he told you, there's nothing that Jesus promises that he doesn't complete. Now, some may have this idea of, you know, you guys worshiping this, this uh, dead and, and risen Savior. Uh, oh, that's all a bunch of hogwash. That's all a bunch of nonsense. But it's because of the resurrection that you and I have the power to witness of this with authority, with truthfulness. And hopefully, as we witness or as 
as we share this, these people will join the millions upon millions that throughout history have surrendered their lives and hearts to our Savior Jesus Christ, this resurrected one. We want to lift the darkness that's in people's hearts. We want to lift this, the despair that sin brings to the life of the unbeliever. We want to have life, we want them to have life beyond the dreadedness of the daily routine of I wake up and I do the same thing over and over and over again. Jesus gives us new life through the resurrection. It's a gift. <laughs> it's beyond the grave. The second gift that we're given by the resurrection is joy beyond belief. Joy beyond belief. The resurrection gives us joy beyond belief. It's beyond human understanding. You see, if humans could comprehend the resurrection in its entirety, everyone would be saved. But it's the Holy Spirit that reveals the truths of the resurrection to those that open their hearts and are willing to hear and to accept what's been done for them. See, that gives us the kind of joy that lasts forever. It gives us the kind of joy that underguards our life here on earth, despite our problems, despite the situations we may be facing in life. We have a joy that is beyond understanding. That's a gift that the Holy Spirit or the resurrection gives us. We have hope even in the dark time. Now some may say, well, you know, that gospel stuff, that sounds too good to be true. Well, you know what? The gospel is too good not to be true. We can never exhaust the truth of God's word and of his gospel. It's the joy that keeps us pursuing God here on earth. You know, sometimes faith has to catch up with our joy. In Jesus, everything sad will come to an end. All the suffering, the pain, of this present world will be swallowed up in a giant sinkhole of death and then covered over with a garden. The garden will be so beautiful that it will make all the pain that we feel in this life fade in comparison. When Christ comes again, he will make us like himself. The Bible tells us that we don't know what we will be, but Paul says, I know that we will be like him. This is the promise, that if he rose from the dead, there is something for us to look forward to as we apply our faith in Jesus Christ. That's a joy that never ends, a joy that begins now and runs through all eternity. In heaven, all our suffering, our tears, our pain will be washed away. Joy will be the routine of heaven. You won't have to muster it up or look for it. It will be with you daily. C.S. Lewis is quoted as saying that joy will be the business of heaven. Coffins will open up. Ashes will reconstruct. Old bones will come back together. Skin will be repaired. The hole that we fill will be empty once more. The stench of death will be blown away by the fragrance of a new life. He will turn graves into gardens. And one day the joy of the resurrection will blow through the remains of all believers and we will receive that gift of joy that's beyond belief. The third point, the third
third gift of the resurrection is a mission beyond borders. A mission beyond borders. You see, it's the resurrection that gives you purpose in life. The age-old question of why was I born? Why do I exist? What's my meaning in this world? The resurrection has the answer for that. We have a mission. And that mission is beyond human borders. See, Christ, Christ's work in us is so that we can fulfill the mission of God through us. Christ does a work in us so that he can work through us. There's witnesses of his name, as witnesses of what he's done for us. When God saves us, he calls us to his mission. Make no mistake of that. His work for us leads us to his work through us. So the point of the resurrection is not to sit back and wait for this pie in the sky, the good old by and by, and heavenly afterlife. It's not to give our religion some kind of meaning. The point of the resurrection is this, proclamation. Jesus told the women, go tell my brothers that I have risen from the dead. Go tell. Proclamation. The message is about the Messiah. And the message is for sinners everywhere, including you and I. For we all fall short from the glory of God. We all need this message of the resurrection to change us and to give us a purpose, a mission without borders. It's about dying to sin and being made new in God. See, forgiveness is available because of the averting sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and because of the life-giving power of the resurrection. You and I are soldiers in the army of the Lamb of God. And there's a breeze blowing through this army of messengers. And that breeze is the person of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God that empowers us to be on mission. The borders aren't confined to Jerusalem. The borders aren't confined to just our church. Our mission is to tell the nations of the power of Jesus Christ. They must hear this message and we are the messengers. See, the Spirit of God uses the gospel of God to motivate the people of God to be on mission for God. To be about the work of God. That's, that's the mission without borders. That's the gift of the resurrection. So the point of the resurrection is to empower us, to empower you, the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you, the Bible tells us. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in you. Let's make that personal. And let's say the same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in me. Can you say that with a straight face today? Say that with me. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in me. Let's say that again. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead lives in me. Do not be ashamed of it. It's the power of the resurrection. It's more than just a happy ending. This is a happy beginning for us. This is a happy beginning to our lives as we surrender ourselves to Jesus and believe in his resurrection. See, the resurrection is so important that Paul, the Apostle Paul, spends a whole chapter on the description and what it means to the believer. 
what this resurrection means to the believer. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Paul devotes this entire chapter unpacking the resurrection and the significance, the importance of it, and how we're to be witnesses of the power of this resurrection. Now I know, I've been told this before, Pastor Joe, I can't, I can't do that. I don't have to get, I don't have to get to share Jesus with somebody. I, I don't know what to say. I wouldn't know how to approach this. Well, in that same chapter of 1 Corinthians 15, if we read verses 3 and 4, um, we'll see something very special here that is for us. It's for us who think we can't or we don't have the ability to share God's love and God's word. Listen to this. For what I receive, I passed on to you, Paul says. So what's the first thing here that we see? You can't give what you don't have. See, this is of first importance, he says. To pass on to others what you received yourself. First thing we need to do is to surrender, to accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior, to accept the power of the resurrection, to make him the Lord of our lives. If we're having trouble telling others about Jesus, maybe we first need to examine our first step. And then he goes on and he says, um, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So this is according to the Bible. So what you tell others is that this is what's written in the word of God. We have a movement today and day where people call themselves Christians that will with the same breath say they do not believe in the Bible. Now my question, you know, I'm a logical person. My question is this. How could you believe in something but you don't believe in the authority that's telling you about that something? Hello? I don't believe the Bible. Well, then you can't believe in Christ because it's the Bible that tells us about Christ. It's the Bible that tells us that on the third day, he rose with power. Oh, it's old-fashioned. Don't you say it was? Oh yeah, but I believe in God. How hypocritical that statement is. It's the Bible that tells us who the creator of heaven and earth is. Right in the first chapter. So we tell them that through the scriptures we see that God rose Jesus from the dead. That's verse 4. That he was buried. So, I mean, he was dead, right? This proves that he was dead. And that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. So we tell people about this. The importance of this. But then Paul ends this chapter of 1 Corinthians 13 with, with verse 58 with this statement. He says, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. When you show kindness and you show love to others, listen, you may not, they may not reciprocate that. They may not be even grateful for it. But it's not in vain. It's not in vain. When you share the love of Jesus with others, when you share the saving message of Jesus with others, they may not receive it, they may not accept it, but I tell you, it's not in vain. Why? Because you may not see results right away, but God is working in the background. Our work in Him, for Him, is not in vain. We have been given life beyond the grave. 
We have been given a joy beyond belief, and we have been given a message beyond borders. And all of this comes through the power of the Holy Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, that lives in you as she just confessed a few moments ago. Our labor of love for the Lord is not in vain. And proclaiming the power of Jesus and the power of resurrection is never in vain. Never be embarrassed of it. So we're going to close today's uh, message time The Bible reminds us that it is power that rose Jesus from the dead. That it was power that put Jesus in the grave. That there are these two powers. The powers of good and the power of evil. And that we are in a battle. And as believers, we are soldiers in the army of Christ. And the resurrection of Christ is our major weapon. Never be ashamed to proclaim Jesus lives. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that your word does not return to you void. That what you speak fulfills its mission. That nothing that we do, Lord, in your name is ever in vain. If we give a cup of water to someone in need, it's not in vain. If we love the unlovable, it's not in vain. If we reach out to reconcile with those that have hurt us in the past, it's not in vain. Because the resurrection offers us new life. The resurrection offers us, offers us a mission to serve you. Help us to do that, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <laughs>